Ladies and gentlemen, I have another guest on the Kettle Knights podcast, and this is, he is a celebrity in the kettlebell world, <laughs> and, and I have taken it to heart to write an introduction because I don't want to miss out anything, and it's an honor to have you, first of all, but let me introduce the man that we have with us today. His name is John Duquesne. He's an author and CEO of the company Dragon Door Publications. Aside from being a heavyweight in the Tai Chi and Qigong world and his endeavors in the film industry, which I didn't know, he, alongside Pavel Tatsulin, is credited with starting the modern kettlebell renaissance in the United States in 2001 with RKC. And now, if it wasn't for John's vision, the West will probably be still oblivious of the kettlebell's existence. So... It is therefore our duty as kettlebell practitioners to pay tribute to John and appreciate his foresight back in the day. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Gregory. What a awesome. great intro. Hope awesome. I can live up to it. <laughs> yes. So let's just jump into it. Now, how yeah. did Dragon Door get started? So Dragon Door um, got started in 1991. Um, I was studying with a Tai Chi master and he had had a publishing company for books on Tai Chi and Qi Kong. And he asked me if I'd like to start up the publishing company with him again. And uh, I was currently working as on the certification board for drug and alcohol counselors in the state of Minnesota. Uh -huh. And that was, so I had this background in certification, which is very relevant later on. Um, and I, it certainly wasn't really my thing, obviously, um, but I decided, yes, I would jump in and start this publishing company again with my uh, teacher. And it turned out that he really didn't have that much of an idea about publishing. His previous company hadn't been the greatest. Mm -hmm. I had no real business background at that point. Mm -hmm. But I started to train myself in, I was, I'd been an editor for Time Out magazine in mm -hmm. London when it first originated. And I'd always been very involved in everything to do with writing um, and reviewing. So I was able to um, uh, publish a couple of very good Tai Chi books that got acclaim. Mm -hmm. But I struggled to um, be successful because Tai Chi and Qi Kong is... Um, there's very disparate groups who, uh, you know, a lot of different um, strains uh, and ways to teach Tai Chi and Qi Kong. Uh -huh. So it's very difficult to market. But I taught myself basically direct response marketing. I started to build up a catalog, which became very relevant later on, of uh, healing resources and martial arts resources, internal martial arts. And my uh, Tai Chi master actually left the company after a year and a half, and I uh, took over the company entirely. And I started to build up this kind of very loyal following of people who were interested in internal martial arts. And mm -hmm. I started to bring heavy duty um, Tai Chi and Qi Kung masters to do uh, workshops in Minnesota, basically because I wanted to study with them. And eventually I also started to um, create Qi Kung certification systems. Um, uh, it was a time when Qi Kung and Tai Chi were extremely popular. Um, and about, I was also teaching Qi Kung myself on a very regular basis. And um, about 1995, I was teaching at a kind of local um, place called the Open U, which became the Learning Annex later. Mm. And um, one of the um, people who was teaching also there was some weird Russian guy uh, called Pavel Tetsulin. And he had, I was very attracted. He had this um, kind of very brash in your face. You know, nothing, the Soviet, <laughs> the, so the Soviets, you <laughs> yes. know, have the true way for flexibility yeah. and stretching. And then he had something about abs and again, mm -hmm. the West knew nothing, you know, the Russians knew everything. Yeah, yeah. And he, it was like, he was, he was actually, cre and he had like a t-shirt that stared body by Stalin, which goes <laughs> over real well. <laughs> and, and just my yeah. question, John, my yeah. question on, on yeah. that front, was this his shtick or was this his true persona? Okay, it was totally his shtick. 
um, Pavel um, is not, and we'll get can get into this mm -hmm. more later. Yeah. But what yeah. was fascinating? Like, first of all, I showed up at his flexibility workshop. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. were about seventy people crowded into this small room. Wow. There were young ballerinas, there were grizzled vets, there were powerlifters, and they were all getting great results from his stretching techniques. And I saw this guy was very charismatic. He had a, a really interesting presentation style. And he was a good actor. You know, he was a true presenter. He was probably only about 25 or 26 at the time. Um, he had set himself up as a personal trainer. You know, he'd escaped from Russia during that period when Gorbachev opened things up. It was kind of a window. And he ended up in Minnesota. So he had this um, tr little training place in a dungeon in, um, in a bank, like a bank vault. And he started to build a reputation for himself. But I was so impressed by the, the the variety of people that were getting results with him and his, mm -hmm. his whole personality. I went up to him at the end of the workshops, like three hour workshops said, Hey, you know, would you be interested in being published? And he was um, said, yes, you know, let's do this. So we went ahead and published a, a book on stretching called beyond stretching. And to get back to your question, like one thing that, he actually Pavel was very reluctant to admit to was that he is actually a terrific marketer himself. Mm -hmm. he, he's an artist, he's a marketer, and he's a tremendous coach. Um, mm -hmm. He's a very intelligent man, very articulate. Mm -hmm. But I, I had seen like when I obviously was very good friends of Pavel for a very long time, we had dinners together, lunches frequently. Um, we trained together a bit. He took some Qi Kong. I trained with him and he, in person, it was a real gentleman, very sweet natured, kind, um, and he, I'm kind of actually relatively low key, good sense of humor, mm -hmm. but he could really turn it on like a rock star. You know, he would get in front of uh, mm -hmm. the camera, as it were, the audience, mm -hmm. and he would assume this persona of this um, authoritarian kind of Stalinist uh you're on soviet territory now yes. and and he played it up wow. it was a total shtick on a certain level i mean there's a way that he was you know you you buy into your own marketing on a certain level but he was very um he was very oriented i'm more of a direct response marketing person he was more brand oriented but right from the start i could see wow. yeah. he he uh, understood how to make something mysterious out of having come from Russia. Like there were these secrets behind the Iron Curtain. Things had now opened up and he was going to show those secrets to everybody. And I'm very good at, like he and I had this tremendous rapport. You know, I'm British and a kind of British gentleman on some levels. And he was very much the gentleman. And I think he had, he had liked that quality. I also had, um, you know, I have a kind of wild side and I'm able to, to communicate my passion in a very visceral way. Mm -hmm. And I learned that that's, you know, the best way in many ways to kind of communicate your passion is bring a lot of emotion to it, bring, mm -hmm. bring a kind of visceral mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. So, and he and I hit it off big time, you know, in, in many ways, and I could understand where he was coming from in the way he was marketing himself and presenting himself. So it became like a very good, I, I think of it like Mick Jagger and Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones or McCartney and John Lennon, very different Perfect people. Yeah. yeah, but it was like a great match, great mm -hmm. partnership, mm -hmm. um, you know, Prince with his band in the early days. Mm -hmm. It was just like a, a great synergy. Um, so we, um, he actually, I remember, you know, one of the breakthroughs, he took some uh, iron shirt Qi Kung from me and I was explaining, you know, the breathing process for iron shirt and some real light bulbs went off. Like one of my iron shirt Qi Kung trainers had studied as a very young man with his grandfather, these techniques, which are basically high level isometrics and breath control. Mm -hmm. And when he was about 18, he went to college in China, never picked up a weight in his life. He went into the weight room and picked up an extraordinary amount of weight without ever having trained in weights. Mm -hmm. And that kind of Pavel went, yes, you know, and Pavel went on to introduce um, 
his ideas about tension training, uh, how important tension was to, to, to strength training, including isometrics. He, we came out with power to the people that had a very big impact. Yeah, and it was like a, a, a landmark title. So there was some aspect of iron shirt Qi Kung training that he had understood that he then totally matched with his understanding about how to generate tension. He started to develop, you know, the breath breathing behind the shield, mm -hmm. um, those high tension um, mm -hmm. uh, breathing methods that became later part of hard style and RKC kettlebell training. Um, he um, developed from there, um, you know, we did um, various other titles, then like, we did an abs book. And then about 1998, he wrote uh, an article um, uh, about kettlebells um, for a small strength, uh, niche strength magazine um, called Milo, uh, put out by yeah. Iron Mind. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. people kind of started, particularly someone called Steve Maxwell got very excited. A lot of the kind of strength aficionados, people who really were there in, the, in that world mm -hmm. said, hey, kettlebells. And Pavel came to me, he, um, a, Ru a Russian hockey player had given him a couple of kettlebells and they were the kind uh, that were kind of hollowed out. And he said, hey, John, you know, I used to train with these when I was a strength and conditioning coach for the Spetsnaz in Russia as a young man. He was in his early 20s. And um, do you think we can do anything with kettlebells in America? Wow. And yeah, exactly. Wow. And like the only thing that was around at that time were these uh, adjustable kettlebells. Iron Mind was selling adjustable kettlebells. Uh, and uh, uh, uh. so there not was very, uh, there was some, that mm. there was that. Oh, no one was piece. paying attention to them. There was mm -hmm. no book. There was no mm -hmm. video. Mm -hmm. There was nothing. Wow. Um, and, you know, obviously kettlebells have been around in the States and in England and mm -hmm. Germany, mm -hmm. Germ Germany. Yeah. Europe. Back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But it, they completely gone out of fashion. Yeah. There'd been the rise of the machines. Yeah. You know, the rise was, of the uh, machines. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly uh, the matrix happening. Yeah, and and, and, and you know uh -huh. it's either aerobics with ladies yeah. and they're pushing their tush at you through the well, TV, or <laughs> or it was yeah uh, Jane Fonda, you know, yeah, or it was the machines, yeah, and Nautilus um, and, and and then uh, it was like Arthur and Jones, then Pavel yeah. and then there was a lot of like bodybuilding straining away with mm -hmm. huge weights and mm -hmm. puffing up your muscles and Pavel mm -hmm. was very much into functional strength. And there was something very, uh, it seemed like something that could be very appealing about kettlebells. So I said, yeah, let's go ahead and do this. I said, if we're going to be successful with kettlebells, we need to be the authorities. And the yeah. best way to be the authorities is do what any authority does is set up a certification system and say, if you want to uh, be credible as a, as a kettlebell trainer, you need to be certified by us because we're the guys. So we set up the world's first ever kettlebell certification. It was built from scratch. And um, I said, we also got to have a book. We got to have a video. There was no book on kettlebells. There was no video on kettlebells, nothing. Damn so, wow. yeah, so, so Pavel, uh, by 2001, Pavel came out with, some of the core kettlebell exercises that he had learned mm -hmm. in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, we produce, we manufactured the first kettlebells ever of their kind in, in Minnesota, in, in America. And we decided not to go with the hollowed out ones. Yeah. And we developed the, like the 16 kilo kettlebell, nothing like that existed in Russia. We came out with like a solid 16 kilo with a particular size. 24 kilo was modeled on the hollow version. Um, but you know, full weight. And then we did the, and we just had three sizes, 16, 24 and 32, which kind of traditional sizes in mm -hmm. Russia at the time. And may I ask John, just this yeah. is a, uh, quickly, uh, why did you decide to change the size or change the, the diameter? We thought it was going to be actually much the, the ergonomics, like the way mm -hmm. it was going to work with um, using these sizes for the hard style kettlebell approach. Mm -hmm. um, it was going to actually be much easier to use. You didn't have to fill anything. Uh, you didn't have to fill hollow kettlebells. We just thought it would be a, a more efficient 
way to uh, work with kettlebells. So, so you were the originators of the cast iron as yes. we know it. Yes, yes, and, those and, first sizes. Yes. Wow, and and now they've been, they are everywhere. Everywhere. And so I don't know if this uh, I don't want to ask too much, but th that's yeah, just my curious yeah. nature. Sure. Did, did you get a patent on it or? Uh, this was the problem. Yeah. yeah. This was, mm -hmm. you know, kettlebells existed. The name existed. Mm -hmm. And Pavel and I, neither of us were kind of very legally oriented. And we didn't really know what we had. Uh, yeah. You know, oh. so ah. we didn't, we didn't lock down even carefully the uh, intellectual property that we were developing with the RKC. Uh, like we had, mm, you know, I get it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So everyone and their brother within a two or three years said, this kettlebell thing is really hot and jumped in on the on. act and right. they started to go to China to make them. Um, you know what just, what, what, what really now comes to mind is uh, when, when George Lucas uh, released Star Wars, Mm -hmm. the first iteration he wanted to have the rights for the toys because he mm -hmm. believed so much in his product and he knew mm -hmm. that's that's where the money is and and, and i think yeah. the studios were like yeah yeah i'll yeah, take it and yeah. boom it exploded and so wow so in your case if if i'm understanding this correctly you can you can correct me of course you you you're going with this um own production own creation of a camera right. first of all right you're creating yeah. the certification system, but at the yeah. same time, you don't you don't know what you have in your hands. You're like, okay, exactly. let's let's go and see where it leads. Right. And if you would have had the knowledge, or let's say like the the foresight into the future, you'd be like, let's lock this down. We got to own everything about right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's okay. similar to the same thing happened with the founder of chiropractic. You know, the original chiropractor was um, a healer in Iowa. And he had this kind of secretive practice, often without even touching the person. But then mm -hmm. he developed these, you know, techniques for adjusting mm -hmm. the spine. Mm -hmm. And he kept. He used to do it behind screens, but eventually, kind of reluctantly, he let people see what he was doing. And chiropractic exploded and got completely out of his control. And he didn't kind of own it on that level. There's another Obviously, story on, on the smiley as well. The the creator of the smiley. He oh did, really? Yeah, there's a guy. I think he was he was charged from a magazine to come up with a with a design. Oh, so he came yeah. up with the smile. Yeah. <laughs> no rights, no anything. And, yeah. and the guy was broke then years later, but imagine this. Wow. Yeah. But yeah, so, that's another story. You know, we had um you know, the other interesting thing is that the timing uh for kettlebells was perfect because people were getting kind of they were getting distressed by the mixed results they were getting from machines and from, you know, there was a new interest in a kind of something more ballistic, something mm -hmm. where free weights could be used in mm -hmm. a more functional way. There was mm -hmm. that growing and there was people wanted to get out of the usual gym routines. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, so and then on top of that, and, and that was even back then, right back then, yes. you even had these the feeling like, hey, it's, yeah. it's kind of like, yeah, it's you know blowing up your out. muscles yeah time to break wow even back yeah. then mm. yeah so we were and Powell was of course you know really hitting that hard because he was kind of in a sense anti-bodybuilding anti kind of puffed up muscles much more mm -hmm. he was advocating mm -hmm. a different approach to strength and Pavel was also you know a karate person so he had that interest through japanese um karate in that kind of training, you know, much, wow. much more to do with kind of real functional strength. So, um, you know, the other thing that was very relevant was it coincided with 9-11. And suddenly, oh, like, yeah. Pavel, you know, Pavel, he's Latvian, Latvian Russian, but his far his uncle was decorated by Stalin fought all the way from, um, wow. from Russia through to Berlin. His grandfather, I think, was a general in the Russian army. They, wow. He came from a very, very strong military background. Pavel himself didn't, you know, he was a trainer, a physical, you know, he was a strength and conditioning trainer for Spetsnaz. He didn't want to be in the army himself because he, mm -hmm. he said to me, I don't like to take orders. <laughs> and <laughs> Yeah, we know that. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Most definitely. <laughs> and I kind of like that too. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, he, he Pavel absolutely has a thing for the military. You know, he has a great love for the military and the military over here, you know, there was this fascinating dynamic when 9-11 happened. 
like Pavel became this kind of authority figure for the American military and law enforcement, even, you know, the um, wow. you know, SEAL, SEAL teams, they wow. came to him for like specialized training and they saw they were getting results. So he trained the Marines, he trained the SEALs, all kinds of, of, of military uh, units. And they, you know, they're not going to hang around if they don't see results. And mm -hmm. Pavel just had it, you know, on that mm -hmm. level. So that's his wow. big love. And when we, so when 9-11 came, I actually managed to get him on CNN being interviewed about how to best handle going into the caves in Afghanistan, like what kind of training you needed. Um, you know, that we did a lot of PR where we got him, you know, on all kinds of major TV shows as kind of an expert about, you know, we had, we had another one where, um, you know, we were, where we, I, I did a comparison with, um, oh, uh, Saving Private Ryan. Did you ever mm -hmm. see that movie? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah well, like you know, there's this scene where where the German soldier thrusts the bayonet into an American soldier and kills him. Mm -hmm. The American mm -hmm. soldier didn't have the strength to stop the blade from going through his chest and killing him. And I told the CNN guy, say, hey, if you if the American had used Powell's strength training techniques, he might not have died from the bayonet going into his chest. Wow. The CNN talking head used that on cnn wow you know, so it gave us that kind of special credit so we got a lot of marketing credibility from wow. all of the everything that happened around 9 11 mm. and then the military became mm -hmm. in fashion as it were so one of the first things you know we did a lot of marketing you know i understand uh, we were talking a little bit beforehand that there's some idea out there that mm -hmm. You know, there was only word of mouth. We really just sat back and it happened. Mm -hmm. But actually, um, we did a tremendous amount of marketing. And I'm very proud of what we did with the marketing. And mm -hmm. I had built up this catalog, which became called Hardstyle. And Hardstyle Catalog, we printed 100,000 64-page catalogs, jam-packed with interviews, articles, um, and products, of course. And that went out at least four times a year. So that's like 400,000 people wow. getting this print catalog. Old school. Uh, yeah. Old school. Printing stuff, right. sending yeah. it out. Yes. No, no Facebook ads. Yeah. Sending and, it to people. Yes. Mm. And it became mm. like a revered um, magazine. Yeah. Pavel also was writing for Muscle Media, Bill yeah. Phillips' um, mm -hmm. uh, magazine. Mm. And he was like a highly respected trainer a coach for um, you know, the articles he wrote in Muscle Media. And we had a full page ad in every issue of Muscle Media advertising our kettlebells wow. and kettlebell certification. Um, we did an absolute ton of marketing. And, um, you know, what happened, um, there was a the very first kettlebell certification was September 2001. It was right at about the time of 9-11. Mm -hmm. And one person who showed up at that was Jeff Martone. He went on to be the mate, the um, CrossFit, right? Yeah, he became mm -hmm. the, the CrossFit guy. He was with mm -hmm. us for a very long time. Super mm -hmm. guy. Mm -hmm. One of the guys I most admired. You know, he developed mm -hmm. kettlebell juggling and he went on to do a lot of Jira Boy sport. Super guy. Eventually left, started his, you know, CrossFit sort of kettlebell certification or got them going. Um, Steve Maxwell. Mm -hmm. was there at the first cert he was like super hard charger very dynamic very enthusiastic super passionate very articulate so he had a kind of massive contribution initially and of course eventually he left started his own thing um then there's a gentleman called dave ganulin who came the first cert was like 16 people he went off and started his own certification right away um, right, it, right away and, after two days um and well, so they felt they I, and that's something yeah. that i want to ask you personally now is yeah. did you feel that you know because sometimes um there's so many things so so many valuable lessons that we as, especially young coaches need to understand it, it's about putting putting yourself out there marketing and investing money into into getting your stuff out in front of people, right? That's what so many people sometimes misunderstand. It's like, hey, I just got to do this and it's it runs by itself. 
I mean, that's one thing. But my question to you is, back when this whole thing happened, did you feel inside like, wow, this is going, I have to be wrong, but this is going to be something so big? Or were you a little bit like, yeah, let's see? Very initially, my intuition was that this was going to be very big. Mm. But it was still like, let's see. We did all the right things to make it happen. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it did def definitely. I mean, we also got ourselves on Rolling Stone magazine. You know, we got Pavel as trainer of the year on Rolling wow. Stone. <laughs> this is big stuff. Um, this is yeah, big we stuff. got you know, we got a lot of wow. and that our kettlebell was like kettle up in the, you know, the, the tool of the year. Wow. Um, we we really worked it on that level. So but, you know, what I wanted to say is that, yes, You know, what was fascinating, oh, we were also, you know, we had established a, a pretty darn good website by 1999, 2000. We had a very strong forum, and the forum became a major vehicle for um, influencers and early adopters spreading the word. There was, there was tremendous amount of information being shared about the value of the kettlebells. And then we would listen to the language that people were using to describe their results. And then we would translate that into effective marketing. Mm, awesome. And then yes, we would take, yes. we would make note of people who were particularly enthusiastic and turn them into heroes. So for instance, there was Nate Morrison, who um, I don't hear about him much now, but he was a um, recon and he went to Afghanistan and he sent us photographs of him playing with our kettlebells in Afghanistan mm -hmm. at one of the Air Force bases. Mm -hmm. We put him on the front cover of Hardstyle magazine. Man. We had a huge interview with him, photographs of him using kettlebells in Afghanistan. And we we did that again and again. Um, we um, got an article with an interview with Dan Inosanto in Black Belt magazine, thanks to Mark Chang, wow. who was very influential. We ran, a, it was like a three page interview with Dan Intersanto about his results. And Dan Intersanto was, you know, very close to Bruce Lee. Um, we kind of lionized him and kettlebells. And there, you know, we started to build associations where these heroic figures, and that was something from, you know, the Russian background. The Russians were really into these kind of heroic postures. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. our first book, uh, Russian Kettlebell Challenge had American and Russian flags behind and Pavel in this iconic kind of uh, Russian posture. Um, we used these images for people to get, to excite them about, you know, these were like heroic figures who you could imitate and aspire to be. And initially, a lot of them were military or martial arts figures. But then over time, we started to see that actually as many women were mm -hmm. interested in kettlebells as these mm -hmm. kind of rugged military types and um, strength aficionados. So it started to branch out. Um, but we work very hard to make heroes out of people like Steve Maxwell, Steve Carter, you know, when he eventually came on, he was a little later, but you know, we featured him a lot. Um, we started selling his videos. Um, he was one of our senior instructors for quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, Another one was, um, oh, Mark Rifkin, yeah. um, mm -hmm. known as Riff. Mm -hmm. um, he was a gymnast. He had hurt himself quite badly and kind of Powell's training helped rehab him in a, in a very significant way. And he became, he's one of the most articulate uh, coaches out there about the benefits of kettlebell training. And he became like a huge uh, influencer for us. And they would contribute articles, they would deliver talks, they would also, you know, Pavel was a tremendous listener. And he was passionate about really developing the system organically, nothing was necessarily set in stone, he listened very carefully, oh, mm -hmm. and absorbed the training mm -hmm. wisdom from people like Mark Rifkin, um, Steve Cotter, um, Jeff Martone, they, they each um, Steve Maxwell, Dan John later, um, they each had something and Pavel was amazing at, at absorb, he absorbed things from me, he absorbed from all these people and the system kept growing. I mean, Pavel made this all up on a certain level. Um, I don't think people fully understand the extent to which, you know, there's, there's a mystery there, but at the same time, 
it's you've got to give him full credit mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. developed this and then he also in a very healthy way absorbed all this additional yeah. training information from some of these original instructors and um, that's something and i think that's something john that is visible when you when you read his articles or watch his videos yes what i love uh, about yes. pavel's persona is he always quotes this dude this yes. guy this gal this coach th and this is something that is um this speaks volumes for a coach himself to say listen or I have my great coach, blah, blah, who said, blah, blah, now we do da, da. He, he could be like, yeah, and I came up with, right? And, and yes. own everything by yourself, but say, no, I'm listening because you are sitting on a table, you have great ideas coming together and then you pick the best ones. So let's listen to everybody, right? Totally. So he was wonderful on that level. And I think that's one of the reasons RKC and the whole kettlebell movement became as powerful as it did is that um, he was that generous in bringing people in. Mm -hmm. Now, what then happened, of course, at a certain point, you get people like, um, uh, um, who am I thinking of? Mike Marler, for instance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, who Mike and um, Jeff Martone, Steve Carter, Steve Maxwell, at a certain point, they wanted to have their own show. You know, it was like in the days of like heavy rock and roll where there'd be, you know, uh, there'd be a, a, a star who would be with a particular band. He said, no, I want to go solo. I want to have my own thing. They were that good. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, there was some discord there. It's never pretty when, when those kind of breakups happen. But eventually a lot of those people did move on. Like Steve Carter and started his own organization. Um, and has done very well. Um, same for many of the others, Steve mm -hmm. Maxwell. And there were other people behind the scenes more, like Rob Lawrence was one of our original. You don't hear much about Rob because he's essentially a businessman at this point, but mm -hmm. Pavel would run his books by someone like Rob Lawrence and was very humble in a certain way in taking advice oh, from okay. others mm -hmm. to improve Mm -hmm. what you know what he was writing and then mm -hmm. there was uh, brett jones was another person who was very influential i think he's now their strong first mm -hmm. ceo I, I ceo think. um mm -hmm. yeah. and um gray cook was another person who was wow. in there from, as you uh, know, from functional from, movement systems yeah, yeah. he I, but he was a very big fan of our kettlebell training and then we of course did a wow. a uh, something called ckfms where we brought him in and there was a program where you get certified in kettlebells wow. and functional movement so all these heavyweights gather together now when we look back it's like wow you had yeah like the avengers man it's yes <laughs> <laughs> seriously they're yeah. true kettlebell avengers yeah <laughs> yeah and it, wow. it was yeah it was really something it was really something and, and my question uh, john if i may ask i mean if, yeah. if you have all these these heavyweights together yeah um like you mentioned sometimes you know some something some somebody wants their own part their own show um do you think did did you attend anticipate it like listen we have so many great figures together i don't know if we can hold this together and then the process would be like okay somebody's breaking off or did you try to like hey let's let's stick together and, and let's make this work together we can achieve more or are they kind of vibe how how was that going down mm, no it was much more organic and we didn't think, oh, you know, these guys are going to break away. Um, it just, there was a certain point where um, there was nothing premeditated on our part saying, hey, um, we're going to have to watch out or is there a way we can adjust? And I, I don't know whether we could handle it better. Um, I'm not sure what that would have looked like, but eventually it was a split. And sometimes, again, you know, not necessarily, I wouldn't want to sugarcoat it. Sometimes it was not that pleasant mm -hmm. because the folks who broke away wanted to set themselves up as kind of a better alternative in some ways. Um, mm -hmm. And so, no, we didn't, we, didn't, um, we didn't adjust in any way or have any plans about how to kind of hold everyone together. Is it is one of the reasons because it grew so fast or everything was going so quickly? And I think then... so. Mm. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. also, you know, we had this, um, you know, if you have someone on the front cover of a magazine going out to half a million people on a regular basis and they're getting a lot of attention, 
a certain point, they're going to say, Hey, I can do this on my own. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is, yeah, it, it, new, it happens new nature, in so many businesses. It happens in so yeah. many cases, right? Yes. Yeah. And if, if we may just segue a little bit into this, because I mean, sure, so many sure. people are interested in, uh, and, and but before before I have one more question, which I sure. think is is interesting as well. You, you came up with the hard style philosophy, and and yes. Pavel, being from the background from from Russia, mm -hmm. um, typically we would assume that there is this kind of kettlebell sport, kettlebell sport idea in Russia, but Pavel created his own idea. So he was like, "Listen, uh, I know this stuff, but let's mm -hmm. create our own." Right. So that was his his idea, right? Totally, totally. Uh -huh. And it was also came from his interest in Japanese martial arts. Uh -huh. And you know, hard style in martial arts, you have hard style and soft style, like Tai Chi is considered internal martial arts or so-called soft. Hard style is more like see that wall go through it. Tai Chi is see that wall go around it. Uh -huh. It's kind of a different philosophy mm -hmm. and <laughs> you know i don't want to That's simplify me. things too much with the difference in jiravoy um it, actually pavel brought um federenko valerie federenko uh, valerie. yeah yeah he brought him to one of our rkc certifications in saint paul wow and he pavel was very open to me taking valerie on and promoting jiravoy sport Wow. So Valerie came and presented and actually had a big impact on a lot of the people. Um, wow. you know, people like Jeff Martone and Steve Carter were there and they were very interested. Mm -hmm. I very deliberately decided that I didn't want to have Dragon Door promoting both Jiravoy sport and hard style. Mm -hmm. I felt that we should settle for hard style and make the most out of that. Valerie wasn't very happy about that. I mean, he, I think he, true, but you've got to give credit to Pavel again. He didn't feel threatened by Jiravoy or, you know, it was just another system. Yeah. He was open to us, you know, helping them develop. Mm -hmm. And we, we gave Valerie some support initially, but I de definitely didn't want to. I felt hard style is, you know, one of the basics of it is that you make it more challenging to do the move. Mm -hmm. And that translates into, um, you know, better force generation and making the body that much more, um, that much stronger for applications in martial arts, contact sports, what have you. Mm -hmm. Jiravoy sport, yeah, I don't have much background in it, but they want to find ways to make the lifting more efficient. It's all about efficiency. Yeah. Efficiency. Mm -hmm. And we, mm -hmm. Pavel really wasn't into efficiency as such because it's not what we were doing was not sport. It wasn't how many, you know, how much you could lift in 10 minutes mm -hmm. efficiently. Mm -hmm. It was about how to create greater functional strength for use in martial mm -hmm. arts or football or whatever. And was uh, one and and was one of the reasons why this tension method of you of mm -hmm. of the heart style ideology. Yeah. Was one of the reasons because the weights are limited because you are, I mean, it's 24, 32 kg, but it's not like you're deadlifting a 100 kilogram. Right. Uh, right. Uh, I think there's heart. definitely something to that also. Mm. Okay. Yes. So yeah, yeah two different systems, but, yeah. and, and the funny thing is I, I, I consider myself some kind of a hybrid that, that uses both. A lot both. of people are. Yeah, yeah I am. It uses both systems, and yeah. I'm actually, I'm actually trying to, um, I'm doing my best to put put a stamp on it. Call it, yeah. That's that's the hybrid, right? It's okay. a hybrid style. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, that's why when I'm listening to you, I'm like, when I just, it's a little bit off topic, but I just bought a course from Frank Kern, who's a master marketer. So oh, yeah, I, I know Frank. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just bought a course yesterday, and I'm yeah, digging in, in digging into his material. That's why you mentioned direct response marketing, which is such a yeah. fascinating field. Yeah. How how psychology works and all that kind of stuff. But it's just um, I'm trying to put put the stamp on it. But it's the combination of both styles, and both are separate from each other. And what happened in this world, in the kettlebell world, at least that was my the sense that I have developed to a certain degree was there's kind of a, a, a a rift in between like it's a, a it's either this or it's either that yeah and my question out of this would be is you focused on heart style more yes most definitely but was it something that that was forced like there there is this kind of either it's this or that or do you think this developed out of the culture 
I think it developed out of the culture. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and it developed out of the culture and also it was a choice. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I'm we're going to just concentrate on this style of lifting for these reasons and just be very targeted. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that suited Pavel too, because Pavel is someone who likes to limit the choices. You know, he he's into um into a kind of approach to brand where people have a very limited menu. Um, yeah. Like he would, mm -hmm. Pavel would not like, doesn't, wouldn't want to go into a supermarket and have 200 different jams to, to consider buying. He wants mm -hmm. to see three different jams and you get this one. Like he wasn't a big fan of doing more than three weight sizes, for instance. Mm -hmm. He wanted to keep it really simple. Yeah. Um, so yeah. there's that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's just focusing on some, and really honing a particular niche and a way of training and and being the representative for that style of training. And this makes sense on so many levels. I mean, the training yeah. perspective is one thing, but the marketing yeah. perspective, this is this is what we are uh, marketing and this is the target audience. So we cannot walk around and then open up and say, oh, well, but it's this, it's this, it's this. And people get confused and then they don't buy, right? right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, being targeted. Yeah, yeah. And and so, after you, RKC grew to such an extent, and then uh, and Dan John mentioned something. He said uh, uh, some kind of a massacre happened, where like every, <laughs> everybody <laughs> <A> massacre. <left. laughs> it's like he, I I I'm paraphrasing a little bit. I think he said yeah. where everybody left to a certain extent. Now we know everybody wanted to have their own show. We get it. So my interest will be what happened with RKC and then strong first why why did Pablo sure. decide to say hey listen i'm gonna do this on my own now sure so i think one of the big shifts that happened there were two big shifts one was that um i signed an author called paul wade um and we came out with a book called convict conditioning which was um became a monumental classic yeah. for yeah. um how to train progressively in calisthenics and you know it had six main exercises like the squat and you could go from just a regular squat to all the way to one legged you know to the pistol there was one arm push up starting out just pushing up against the wall and so on and it's a brilliant book um just an absolute landmark and pavel was very enthusiastic about it he didn't like the title but you know he loved the contents as did most of our people and it became a huge success mm -hmm. um yeah. huge mm -hmm. and it's you know i think pavel really wanted to be the guy with dragon door and he wanted his brand to be represented the way he wanted to be you know which was mm -hmm. you know, a particular kind of tough guy approach mm -hmm. and the other thing that happened was that we started to appeal to women a lot. Uh, my my wife, Andrea Duquesne, you know, came out with some some very good products for women. A lot of the other female instructors also uh, and about you know, 50, 60 percent of the classes were women, not so much in the certifications, but, you know, very strong yeah. representation wow. there. And I mm -hmm. was very much in favor of marketing to women. Um, as well as men, as well as the military. And Pavel really wanted to focus much, much, much more on just the um, the military and strong men. And, you know, that was his shtick. So over time, we started to disagree about how to market ourselves and mm -hmm. how he wanted to be represented differently from the way we were kind of going overall. He wanted it to be that much more attention on him so it became kind of more and more a bone of contention nothing was going wrong with our programs you know everything was solid but he just felt he wasn't again i don't want to speak for him too much mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. but he became dissatisfied with the way we were representing him so um it got to a point where he just you know he he made some ultimatums about how he wanted things to be and I'm very, we're both very strong headed people and we have our own ideas and I wasn't prepared to back down from where I wanted to be and where I thought things should go. And he felt the same way. So again, it didn't, it was, he ended up jumping ship 
in a rather abrupt manner and we had he took about 80 percent of our instructors with him again it didn't protect ourselves very well when that happened so you could call it a massacre in some ways that that, that was probably uh, what dan was <laughs> yeah. <referring> to. <laughs> yes uh, <laughs> mm. um so uh you know it was a very very difficult period for all of us and mm -hmm. a very high number of the people who chose to go with pavel did so not wanting this to happen but it happened you know and they mm -hmm. they chose it was like choosing their original love the trainer pavel coach mm -hmm. pavel yeah. or going with dragon door and yeah. many of them understandably decided to go with pavel and uh, so you know strong first is the the material that strong first teaches at least for you know everything to do with kettlebells is remarkably similar to what the rkc still teaches mm -hmm. i mean it's that's where yeah, it, it's... the material came from um if there's a difference you know people do ask that i'm sure you're wondering like what is the real difference between strong first and rkc on the, at least the kettlebell level what we decided to do was to have all you know, he had this shtick all along, you know, you're yeah. on Soviet, Soviet territory now, yeah. and it was very kind of hard and a lot of emphasis on kind of beat down approach. Yeah. Um, a lot of refined teaching techniques, obviously, but we decided to, to, um, to be more concentrated on coaching, on teaching people who came through our certifications to be really good coaches and to be able to train a, um, a very um, diverse population, people who were very challenged. There was more, mm -hmm. uh, more, we felt breadth and depth to what we offered. But the overall philosophy of the training, no different, you know, and most of the movement taught the same way. So it eventually came down to like the culture that you wanted to be around when you were taking your training, like the, the strong first culture from what I can see is has maintained a lot of that kind of we're the tough guys. Um, and that's that like rough you know, approach. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So we're a little bit gentler, you know, the, the people who represent us these days are people like Dan John. Um, and Dan John speaks for himself. Mm -hmm. Andrew Duquesne yeah. speaks yeah. for himself. Um, mm -hmm. we have, you know, a number of, we have, uh, Chris Holder, uh, Darius Gilbert, you know, there's some people who are, uh, very, very adept and wonderful coaches in their own way, mm. but they don't favor that kind of, they, they went with us because they didn't favor that kind of aggressive beat down approach so much. And I think, and, yeah, yeah, th yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. And, you know, we also, um, we developed our own uh, calisthenic certification program, the uh, PCC. We started doing more books with Paul Wade. Mm. And eventually, you know, we've now come out with our isometrics training device, the um, the isochain, and that mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. very very authoritative book by Paul about isometrics training. So we've just kind of broadened and diversified in a way from um, where we were with when Pavel was the main focus. A funny story because I was I was checking something for. Uh, from your website, which, yeah. which I think is is so uh, iconic that it's still the it looks like the 1990s, like the the original days when when it all when, when the internet happened, and it still has yeah. that vibe. And it's like this is like a people appreciate this. Yeah, Dragon yeah. Door is still like back in the day. <laughs> so yeah. no updates, yeah. no nothing. It just looks yeah. like this. So I remember I was. Um, I was checking something on your site and then I saw the ISO chain and then I saw the price and I was like, what? Wow. Then I, I made a reaction. I was like, I mean, this, there might be something behind it. What, what, what's with that price? And yeah. so, and there is power in isometrics, of course, but my question as it delves into is, so the kettlebell was the main product from RKC, right? Yes, yes, and, totally. But you still, but you still felt like, yeah, but there's still room for other, um, other certifications or just broadening the spectrum in, in that yes. regard, right? Yes, yes. And, and you thought it was a great idea because sometimes I'm like, um, or that's just my limited understanding from where I stand, but honing down on one particular area and saying like, this is what we do. I see this on our YouTube channel, for example. I mean, we have mm -hmm. a YouTube channel with 40,000 subscribers now. Nice. And, and um, we only focus on kettlebells. So I don't do anything else, even though 
I sometimes want to do other stuff. I'm like, listen, this is the audience. They want this. So yeah. give them what they want. Yes. And so from a marketing perspective, back then you thought like, no, let's, let's open up a little bit, right? Yeah, I think, you know, the other thing to remember is that Pavel, you know, um, was very much a body weight exercise yeah, guy yeah, as well yeah. as kettlebell guy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. our book that we published with him, Naked Warrior. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. we got with the that, one arm push up. And, yeah. yeah, we got that to number two overall on Amazon. The only book that beat us out was a Harry Potter book. Wow. So, you know, a lot of people talk about being an Amazon bestseller. We got that to number two overall out of all books on Amazon. Wow. Uh, against uh, Harry Potter. Oh. Against yeah. Harry Potter. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like, oh, it was number one in exercise and fitness. We were yeah. number one against wow. everything. Mm. We're number two. Yeah. <laughs> and so that book sold tens of thousands of copies and was a major, major influence. Mm. And, and again, Powell was yeah. into isometrics big time. You know, he, he taught, uh, and RKC includes isometric training, like the plank and, you know, tightening up in a certain way. So Pavel is a huge proponent of bodyweight exercise, and, and they have their own cert to do with that based on naked warrior type mm -hmm. techniques. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was just that Paul Wade came along and it's a natural, great extra component, you know, body weight and kettlebells, they do work very yeah, well they, together. They were, yeah, they yeah. work all, yeah. 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 They're so, so close. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. So that's not really a conflict. And the isometrics, you know, the, that's not your, your the isochain's not your thing, you're into kettlebells, but what's been attractive to people and why the price is you get to electronically measure the real tension you're generating when you do a, an isometric exercise people mm -hmm. haven't been able to do that before and if mm -hmm. you can't track the actual tension you're generating you're going to leave a lot of strength on the table mm -hmm. so you know when i did use the isochain say do a deadlift and you do you see oh, 300 pounds of tension generated and you realize actually no i can do 350 you actually when you see the readout you realize you could have done more Ah, so ah, okay. that's what's motivating people. Like the problem with isometric training oh, wow. um, is that it's a lonely operation where you don't easily notice the results. Strong men have always used it, you know, and they, yes, then they, it's like their secret weapon. Mm -hmm. And Pavel understands that very well. Mm -hmm. It's also um, very but, taxing for, yeah. It, yes, it is. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's taxing, but it's, it's easier on the joints. You know, really just mm -hmm. six seconds, you know, five times six seconds and boom, you're done with a particular exercise. Mm -hmm. But it's learning, it's being able to see that you actually are not generating all the tension you could be. So that's where the value is. You know, mm -hmm. if you ever explore that, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. why the price is there because wow. it's got very sophisticated electronics in it. Wow. It's not, it's not $500 for just a simple bar and a chain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. So oh, from that so, perspective, yeah, so I there's, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so, you know, mm. there's, there's room for some maneuver. And I, I'm also a believer in, I'm sure you are, well, you definitely are with your hybrid training, is that one of the most important aspects to movement is to have a lot of variety in your mm. movement. Mm. Yes, you have core exercises yep. that you yep. concentrate on, same in martial yep. arts, there's some yep. basic moves you've got to yep. have down, yep. same in dance, but mm. variety is hugely important. You were built our brains are built, bodies and brains are built for a lot of a variety yeah. in movement. Yeah. So, and I, yeah, I see this as well in, in my training. Yeah. I, I, I've, yeah. I've completely changed from the typical uh, split training type of guy into mm -hmm. totally kettlebells after Steve Carter certified us mm -hmm. and, and then really taking down, going down this route of kettlebells. But I still, I, we have a prowler in the gym. We still have barbells. We still have dumbbells. And, and push-ups are great, body weight squats are great. I mean, this is, yeah, most definitely. Mm -hmm. and, and what I think is so fascinating about the kettlebell is that it just gives you, you, you call it this functional strength uh, approach, which is sometimes, when you listen to marketing, it's kind of like a, a, a bastardized term, everybody yeah. thinks it's functional. <laughs> yeah. but, but there's so much truth behind it. If, mm -hmm. if, if you see somebody who's just typical you know um, bench pressing not even not even with a bar but on the on the machine it's mm -hmm. just not the different there's not the different uh skill transfer to other various movements than say like you do it with a barbell or just pressing with heavy kettlebells yes. or whatever yeah. right so there's yeah i mean it's the level of engagement yeah 
you know, that you're so much more engaged when you're using kettlebells. It's so fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And and after this thing happened with Strong First, what what was yeah. your what was your reaction? You were like, okay, so he's doing his own thing now. Um, well, we just continue to do what we do, or was there some conversation back and forth, or just break up and and that's it? Well, there was a lot of attempt um, by folk who were close to us um, to try to keep us together. Mm -hmm. But Pavel, and I was open to that, absolutely. Um, but Pavel was very determined. You know, he, there was no going back as far as he was concerned. So um, what I, it was a very, very difficult period for Dragador, no question, because, hey, um, you know, part of our business was severely threatened. 80% of our instructors left. Um, and it was tough for us to survive for a while in with the kettlebell training when wow. so much had been taken away. Um, mm -hmm. So I um, started to pursue um, relationships with other authors, particularly building up Paul Wade, who brought on the Cavadlo brothers for bodyweight exercise. Uh, we had various other authors. Dan John became more to the front for us. Um, and some of those worked out, some of them didn't. You know, I, I'm I'm pretty good at spotting talent and nurturing it when it fits, mm -hmm. you know, like I did with Pavel mm -hmm. and with Paul Wade, those two in particular, Marty Gallagher, Ari Hoffmeckler, The Warrior Diet. He's heavy. Um, <laughs> these, I mean, yeah. you, you're dropping these names like, you know, yeah, yeah rah, rah, rah. but for us, it's like these are some <laughs> yeah. heavyweights in the game. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's so fascinating. Yo, yeah. Keep going. <laughs> so. Um, but it was also, yeah, it was an extremely difficult period. You mm -hmm. know, it was it was um, the most difficult periods spiritually and psychologically for me mm -hmm. um, in my business life mm -hmm. because um, it was such a disruption. So um, I'm very um, passionate and resilient in many ways. I just kept making things happen. And mm -hmm. uh, here we are. We're still at it. And this but is, I wouldn't want to sugarcoat it. Yeah, it was very tough. And yeah, so so you had this thing happens. So you have this this moment of this realization. Wow, you know, the business. It's not just my my main trainer left, but the business actually in itself is is threatened, right? Yes, totally. So 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 you kept your composure and you said, listen, let's bring bring in these new authors. Let's keep pushing, and. There was never a sense like because RKC and Strong First are so close to each other that it's like, hey, is this going to work because we're so similar now? Or, or... Right. Well, I think one of the things is that I felt I wasn't the trainer who developed RKC. That was Pavel. But I was absolutely instrumental in making it happen. You know, I suggested the idea of developing a certification. I suggested and created the book, made sure we did a terrific video. Um, organized, you know, everything and marketed it for whatever it was, 15 years, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I felt tremendously invested in something that I had, you know, I might not have been the intellectual creator of uh, the particular kettlebell training mm -hmm. content, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I had tremendous personal investment in continuing to provide that, that kettlebell training that I was very passionate about and believed in. So, and so I wasn't about to your, just throw it away. So you had your own approach as well. Even, I mean, Pablo was instrumental in creating it, but you had your own idea about it as well, or you took them from Pablo and then honed it according to your own ideas? No, I, I didn't make, I mean, other than, you know, I think helping, you know, he gave, gave, giving him some ideas from the, from the hard style training approach with the power breathing and so mm -hmm. on from, mm -hmm. from yeah. Iron Shirt Chi Kung. No, it's, it's, I'm I'm not an authoritative trainer on that level, but I so I just feel an ownership for having um, I I guess produced might be the right word produced the RKC. Mm. So you know mm -hmm. like a record producer yeah. or you know an arranger, <laughs> someone who yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So more like Chris Blackwell of Island Records introduced you to and reggae to the West. Um, <clears throat> so. I wasn't about to give that up. Why would I? You know, yes, the systems are extremely similar, but there were, and there were also enough of the, you know, there was Dan John, there was Phil Ross, there was Chris Holder, there was Andrea, 
um, and various others, Robert Ramochi in Germany, Andrew Reid in Australia. Uh, in Germany, uh, you met, ah. Oh. Yeah, Robert Ramochi is still, you know, he's RKC Germany and Dragon Door Germany. Um, he had originally, he's Hungarian actually, but he's lived forever in uh, wow. in Germany. And he has a very robust RKC happening there. And uh, so this, and I, I mean, this that's another thing What where I think your the level of success is so so immense is it, it went around the world, right? Yes. And, and what kind of a task, because we have a lot of coaches listening who are also, I mean, every coach who's self-employed is also a business person, whether he or she likes it or not. Right. But how was the, the, the process of, you know, then it, it goes global and then you have like these people in these countries and how, how are you setting this up and how much, how much of, a, of, 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 a, of an endeavor is this? I mean, it's, now we look like, well, yeah, well, you have RKC Germany, you have this, you have that, blah, blah. But this is such a huge thing that happened. And yeah, if you could just describe some of the processes that happened behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really we needed to rely for it to succeed in another country. We needed people who were real go getters in that particular yeah. country, like probably yeah. the most. Well, the two most significant ended up going with strong first is Peter Lakatosh in Hungary. Mm -hmm. And he um, was uh, originally a student of Ayal Yanilov and Krav Magar. Mm -hmm. Ah. And he built up a very successful, essentially franchise based business in Hungary, um, certifying people in Krav Magar and then mm. taking revenue from them on a kind of franchise basis. Peter came to our certification in Denmark uh, with another go getters, uh, Kenneth J., who did uh, yeah, Viking, Jay, Viking Warrior. Out. He's another very influential Him. figure. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, you mm. know, uh, Kenneth and um, um, another gentleman there helped start certifications in Denmark. And um, Peter came to one of those and Peter's was a very savvy marketer and um, he piggybacked all the kind of personnel that he had built up with Krav Magar in Hungary and kind of persuaded them all to be RKC wow. as well. Mm. So mm. it really, it, it, it takes someone like Peter Lakatosh with marketing background and a drive, uh, someone who can really fire people up um, to be successful in another country for us. Robert Ramochi was like that. Robert originally trained in Hungary with Peter, and then Peter started to groom him for Germany. Mm. Then Robert decided he'd have a wow. better chance with us than with Strong First. Andrew Reid in Australia. Um, Andrew was incredibly loyal. Uh, he's another... Um, hard charger who um, just had that ability to get people excited on our behalf and would get very good turnouts for workshops in uh, Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and Sean Cairns in South Africa. We never did personally get down to, to South Africa. He's now with Strong First. Mm. Um, but there's, there's, it does take someone with a lot of personal interest and business background to be able to make that happen it's and again it was it frankly it was hard for me to to stay on top of you know i really was more comfortable coming to some kind of licensing agreement say okay you guys run uh, it the way you need to do it that you do it yeah. that's and that's yeah. like the the idea these are the rules let's go yes All right? yeah mm. yeah mm. And, and this is so important for for us to know i mean i i now see it from from certain perspectives, especially since I'm now really learning, which is the beautiful thing of this today's day and age that we live in, you have the possibility to learn in so many areas from so many people and, and the ability to reach so many people yes. in, 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 in one yeah. particular way. But it's just understanding how much, how important marketing and the business side and, and branding, I mean, you mentioned, I it's think huge. this, this yeah, sounds like, huge. yeah. And it sounds like such a power combination you have Pavel, the guy who's brand orient, the branding, right? The person. Yeah. And then you have the guy direct response marketing who shoves it in your face, right? So yes. that's, yes. that's such yeah. a powerful combination. Yeah, it really is. And it's, and it works so well together. And so you realized when you take it around the globe, you have to have people in, in general who, 
who are and 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 that's one thing that I that happened to me. We always talk about the kettlebell effect or what the hell effect. Yes. So when when everybody else picked up that thing, was it like wow? Initially, because when I talked to Sean Sean Mosen, he was like I think he did a cert with with you guys as well back in the long day, time, right? Long, long time. time. And he was yeah. like, and everybody knew like they had something in their hands. Yes. And why? Why did this get lost? Because I know going through history, it started in 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 in, in Europe to a certain extent. Yeah, Russia. Yeah. Right, and then it went to Russia through Lebedev and all these heavyweights, Dr. Yeah. Krajewski and blah blah blah. Yeah. And then it came back, right? So we had the Renaissance right. in the West. So, but what? How did it get lost? This is. I think that it takes someone with the vision that Pavel had to inspire people and a set of like really effective ways to use the instrument mm -hmm. to make it work. Mm -hmm. So it was like a perfect storm of like training knowledge, timing, and something that was very inspiring. So then, you know, when when people understood the value of the swing and got to experience mm -hmm. the swing mm -hmm. and what it would do, or the snatch, mm -hmm. it was a what the hell effect and a wow effect immediately. Mm -hmm. But it was, there'd never been a central figure like Pavel who was able to bring it all together. You know, it's it was, like the it was Leonardo, just in all these different places, but and yeah. then you had to bring it together, it's, right? It's like, you know, a great wow. physicist or Leonardo da Vinci or Galileo, or it's just having the right person give you the vision at the right time. Wow. With the, the right expertise, just bringing it all together. And great credit to him for having coalesced, and not just the coalescing of, of great training knowledge, but also to have had to be able to do it in an inspiring manner. Because that was, you know, very much part of it. Just having that inspiration. Yeah, and and it took, and and that's that's what it was. I, it took. I I touched kettlebells seriously, in, in 2019. All right. So before I heard about it, but everybody everybody in the fitness world, we everybody heard about Pavel. So it was like this: the Russian guy with, with, with yes. the kettlebell thing. Yes. And I remember this one bodybuilding dude. I, I reacted to one of his videos. I, I couldn't I couldn't hold myself from laughing. He was like, Yeah, the reason why you're you're not supposed to use kettlebells is because they're made for special units. And and special he said <laughs> I love how we framed it. He said, Because you have to imagine you had you had the the, the, the spetsnats going after the Mujahideen. So uh, and they were training with kettlebells. So that's a tool that's only reserved for special units, and you're not a special unit. <laughs> oh, crazy, crazy. Yeah. But but I love how how the the marketing. You like you were aware of it. You you said, listen, we we gotta get you in front of these covers. Go with that stick, p push it because that's what people want, right? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, it's a very interesting area because. As I said, like Pavel is relatively low key in person. I'm relatively mm -hmm. low key in person, mm -hmm. but we can both turn it up as, you know, on an entertainment level, as it were, um, where you really um, present in a, a, a way that's extremely compelling because otherwise people aren't going to pay attention. So, you know, there's a question like you, you were asked earlier, how much was this real? You know, like, you know, was Pavel really Pavel? Um, you know, how much of this is true? I mean, that's questioned. You know, there were people who claimed that it wasn't all true. Well, in marketing, it's very interesting because, you know, the, the old cliche, you've got to sell the sizzle, not the steak. Mm -hmm. The people mm -hmm. aren't going to buy the steak. They're going to buy what's, what's going to excite them about eating the steak. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, Pavel actually, more than me, I would say, was great at pushing the envelope, let's say, like like he did with his persona of this like Stalinist figure who was like, I know better, you know, the, the party is right was one of his lines. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the party is always right. Yeah, the party is always and, right. Yeah. And, you know, tongue in cheek, but of course people bought into it and became yeah. like more Pavel than Pavel mm -hmm. and more authoritarian than Pavel. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, 
Yeah, I mean, he had to downplay when he, I first met him, I didn't use him in his mid 20s. And he was very, he wouldn't want to admit to how old he was because people wouldn't take him seriously. He, sti he, he still was... has that. When, when he was on Joe Rogan, he, Joe he Rogan asked him, how old are you? And he was like, that's not. That's a classified. Movie. That's classified information. Stop, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. So, so, so wow. you know, he was a youngster. I mean, he was truly a youngster and mm -hmm. he had to, you know, and he knew, I mean, he's savvy enough to know that it's hard to be taken seriously when you're 25 years old a lot of the yeah. time. Yeah. Um, you can mm -hmm. get away with it if you're Mick Jagger, maybe, but mm -hmm. I mean, you know, generally in the yeah, training. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so um, he understood and, you know, he was, he what spent two years at most training with as a, as a, you know, a coach for the Spetsnaz, but he wasn't, in the military as such he was a trainer and then he got out mm -hmm. so he's a very young man and but he was very brilliant and had all this russian training knowledge east european plus extremely good understanding of how this all correlated with training in the west but he had to present it in a way where he he was he you know we we over blew the who he was yeah mm -hmm. as himself mm -hmm. and it's not that you're you're being dishonest or you're lying, but you're definitely adding the sizzle, just yeah. making it more attractive. And you've got to be prepared to do that. You know, they, if you are just trying to be matter of fact, people are not going to pay attention. You know, you've got to, I mean, that was the beauty with him was that he had that understanding mm. and I do too. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. And, yeah. and what I think, it's just from my limited understanding is if you have if you have a powerful product and you know and and i somebody recently said or i, I remember somebody reading this in a forum pavel or rkc strong first you guys have built a business upon the backs of satisfied customers exactly so so it's not just it's not just fluff no it, it is serious and so i think isn't it isn't it the case that if you know you have something serious in your hands you're like listen this is this is magic this is going to work you have to you have to go balls to the walls with the marketing just 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 tell everybody and go go crazy with it right right and then you can let the stories speak for themselves yeah. and that's what we did over and over and over again it's like the old thing is that that if somebody has a problem you arrive and show them the solution yeah. they put the solution into practice yeah. and the result is they transform yeah. and then they tell their story it's like the hero's journey mm -hmm. and we set ourselves up finally as the car the guide you know we make someone go through we help people go through a heroic journey all heroes are people who overcome a challenge mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Everyone who came to kettlebells has some kind of a challenge that they're wanting to get over. And the bottom line, yes, you can brag all you want. You can hyperventilate, you can balls to the wall, but finally, when someone uses what you're, you're sharing with them, it's got to have those results. And then you can have them tell the story. You know, Gregory can get up there and say, yeah, I used to be this. And now I'm I, as a result of what I've gone through Most with. Definitely. Uh, RKC or Steve Cotto, whomever, I'm now living yeah. a much you, more yeah. satisfying, productive, engaged life. And and it's the same thing that I'm getting f from Frank Kern now, since I oh, bought yeah. his program yesterday. Frank's great. <laughs> I, I, his his He's marketing, very funny, too. very funny, very entertaining, yeah. and and yeah. serves a lot of value. Yeah. And and he and he uses all the. And I love what he says. He says, "Well, it's just been around forever." Yeah. <laughs> well, it just works since forever. So you have these these basic premises, and he goes through them, and and he does a great marketing game. But then you buy his stuff, and it's like, whoa! I, I've learned in one and a half hours watching his stuff and taking notes and writing stuff down. I I realize, wow, this is what I'm making wrong. This is what I'm doing wrong. This is I gotta correct this. And and it's always like it makes sense. And I think yes. it's the same thing with with kettlebells and and Pavel RKC Strong First whatever. It's the stuff makes sense. The stuff works, but still somebody has to go behind it. When, when you texted me the email, you're like, we sent out 100,000 
of these booklets, these 68 pages booklets. Yeah. It's like the story is not going to, well, it's going to evolve, but you have to, you have to push it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we did, um, I remember I was thinking about the direct marketing, you know, with, um, we came out with a, a set of videos from called Marshall power. Um, and I went down and got them f f uh, film Pavel doing a training for um, a group down in Texas, in mm. Galveston, Texas. Mm. And they were, um, you know, a group of um, special police. And we turned that into Marshall Power. And I produced, I think it was, I had 24, 32 page sales letter, print sales letter. And we wow. sold like $300,000 worth of these videos. And if we hadn't done that, we just said, hey, here's a training for um, SWAT. They were SWAT team members mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. that whole area of Texas. Mm -hmm. We said, oh, here's a training and just a few lines uh, uh, about it. We'd have sold maybe $5,000, $10,000 worth. But you've got to get people fired up. You, and, um, and so, it's so crucial to understand as, as yeah. young coaches. And, but but there's, I think there's another side to it if we just delve a little bit into the business side of things which like i mentioned i have limited understanding but i think I, i've gained some knowledge in that regard is in 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 the day and age of social media you have you have this overblown approach where it's like it's all fluff and because uh, it's so yeah. easy to put it out there it's like you feel and that's when people come to us they're like yeah but i see this guy do this i see <laughs> i see for example juggling i mean juggling was one of the original ways how kettlebells came to be when when, when we study the, the yeah. history to a certain extent yes and yes juggling is fun juggling has some 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 uh, uh certain capabilities but it's it's not going to be the swing it's not going to be the clean or press or, or or a snatch but we have the shiny object syndrome which nowadays is so rampant yeah. that sometimes it's hard to to go through the real stuff right true very true to a certain extent yes very yeah. true yeah so um wow this, this has been this has been a fascinating trip down <laughs> memory lane my final question for you now first of all john I, I have to appreciate and say say thank you and i think on behalf of all the listeners and and folks that are watching that that you are giving us so much of your time um I, i'm learning a lot i'm i'm enjoying this so much so on a final note um how is it today in 2022 is rkc and strong first still kind of like yeah we coexist but we don't mention our names or yeah is it i've said the name more in this interview than i have in the last five years okay <laughs> it's usually the the company that cannot be named <laughs> there comes the harry potter vibe again yeah Here exactly we go. Yeah. <laughs> this is fascinating yeah yeah Voldemort. yeah Voldemort. Uh, so, uh, so yeah i mean let's face it i mean we are major competitors so if someone is People are going to choose. Are they going to go with them? Or are they going to go with us a lot of the time? So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, we coexist, yes. And, yeah, that you, know, you hear that cliche about, oh, competition is healthy. Yes, it is, but we'd rather you came to us than them. So mm -hmm. it's ongoing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And that's something, you know, from, from a personal side of things, I – Coming from my background now, talking to I, I've talked to Valery Fedorenko as well on the podcast. I, I've had Dan John, Dennis Fazilev. Now you, I have all these heavyweights. So <laughs> I'm I'm influenced by everybody. So um, do you think there is like this approach that yeah, s sometimes you you have to choose and then you stick with it and yeah, you know the competitors next to you, but you have to ignore it and and go along with it, or do you think there is there is room for, you know for a harmonious coexistence where we start learning from each other again or, or do you think what's the plan with con or, or your ideas concerning RKC is it something that it's going to stick like this and we probably never get back together or we won't get back together that's unrealistic you know okay. I think it's there's just people who have preferences for one style one yeah. culture yeah. It's like choosing, there's so many martial arts, right? Even yeah. within Taekwondo and karate, there's just so many different flavors. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a matter, again, of presenting the culture you want 
Most yeah. of the core techniques are going to be the same from yeah. one organization to another. Yeah. But it's the culture that you want to join, the tribe you want to be part of. Yeah. You know, the ethos, um, the particular way of conducting yourself, um, the way the information is presented. Yeah. Um, if you want to stay relevant, you've got to stay open for sure. Mm -hmm. And the more you can be open to including um, new ideas, mm -hmm. uh, the better mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, I think there's a limit uh, when people yeah. are in business, yeah. they're going to be yeah. rivals. Um, so there, there can be a certain amount of crossover, but you know, there's also going to be, you know, that if you, if you, are you going to buy a BMW or are you going to buy a Volkswagen? Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, you're going to buy one or the other generally. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it comes down. A lot of it is marketing, but it's also the, the culture that you create for mm. people mm. and the support that you give people. On, on a final note, I saw this great ad from, I think it was BMW where the, the, the CEO of Daimler Benz from Mercedes Benz stepped down. So he, he comes home, is greeted, he leaves the building and everybody's like, hey, we're so awesome, giving him hugs. He goes down, he's escorted in the Mercedes Benz, so he comes home and then the doorways come up from the garage and he leaves with his BMW and then it's like, oh, <laughs> finally he can be himself. <laughs> That's I, good. Yeah, I, that's just like Pepsi and cola. It's like, yeah. uh, which we, yeah. everybody enjoys it to a certain extent. But exactly. And I think what yeah. you're now saying, if, if I'm understanding this correctly, is like I mentioned, it's not the steak, it's not the swing or the clean or the press. You can learn it from everybody. It's yeah. the sizzle around it, right? So, yes. yeah. what, and, and on a final note, that's something that drew me to Steve Carter. So, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I tend to be the guy, we work with beginners, we work with everybody. And, and I tend to be incredibly open. Of course, I am, I am limited to a certain extent where I don't accept everything as at face value. Like, yo, this is, if you start break dancing with the kettlebell, sometimes I'm like, ah, <laughs> yeah. well, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> if you like doing it, keep doing it. Awesome. Yeah. But um, um, at, on, on a certain place, I, I think I have found my way in, in, in the kettlebell world. But I was more open to Steve's way of, of, of communicating. Okay. So, so more the, um, the way of, of t teaching the material and not this, not this tough guy approach, right? Mm -hmm. But I also get it to a certain extent, but I never kind of felt... It wasn't who you were. Yeah, yeah. it just wasn't yeah. me, right? Yeah. And I think that's another lesson that I've learned. It's like you have... That's why you have different businesses and that's why you have different coaches because yes. it's not, and I tell this our, our viewers or our subscribers all the time. I'm saying, listen, I'm telling you stuff based on my experience, based on the experience with our people and, and clients or whatever, but you have somebody else saying something maybe even completely different, right? So we have to, we have to accept this and understand this. Mm -hmm. Which is sometimes it's like when people, because I have Dan John on, it's, I think I had him on for the fifth time. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and Dan John He's is so a, great. yeah, he, it's awesome. I've learned, I call him my mentor. I'm like, can I call yeah. you my mentor, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, he's against heavy Turkish get ups. And so then uh, people start commenting on our channel and asking me, well, Gregory, why are you still doing Turkish get ups heavy? I'm like, because I enjoy it. But, yeah. but Dan John said, yeah, and Dan is right. <laughs> but still, I enjoy doing heavy Turkish get-ups, right? Yeah. Awesome. So, uh, John, uh, I appreciate it 100%. Oh, have, thank you. Thank you. We have learned a lot from, from the history. <laughs> and I think there's probably even more to share, but let's just leave it at that. I think if, if you want to do it again, you're most definitely open. Thank you. It's great join. talking with you. Yeah, I was really, really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, John. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Gregory. If you're looking for kettlebell courses that can help you lose weight, build muscle, and improve your kettlebell technique, then check out the Leberstock Academy. Let us help you discover a new perspective on kettlebell training, making it simple and easy for you to understand. Join the waiting list of your desired course now and secure your spot when it's open for enrollment. Link is in the description.